We are a justice-seeking, we are justice-making, truth-seeking people. We are We share a reverence for the mystery of life. Let us worship together. By Don Shea Cooley. We light our chalice this morning, grateful for the love that we experience in this beloved community. May the flame light the way for all who seek such abundance. Please rise in body and or spirit and join us in singing number 123 in the gray hymnal, Spirit of Life.
The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, service, learning, and joy. One way to live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, income inequality, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. The plate share recipient for today and until the end of September is in support of our programs at Walt Whitman Elementary School. Our volunteers stock and operate a mobile library in the school and offer other services such as tutoring and after school bananagrams as permitted under pandemic guidelines. Donations are used to purchase books and supplies. Ushers, please come forward. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. Each week, members of our community share their joys and sorrows. If you'd like to share a joy or sorrow in a future service, you can click on the Share Joys or Sorrows button on the BUC homepage, or you can arrive a bit early and write in the book at the back of the sanctuary. Though we have no written joys or sorrows today, we know that they are out there. If you feel so moved, speak the names of those on your heart. by Dero Farrar, that which is in us and all around us, and which constantly draws us to our holiest selves, bring me into a practice of loving without fail. Strip me of any fear or arrogance that might prioritize my own comfort over the care of others, and help me to be forgiving of myself and others when our expressions of love fall short of the truth. Amen.
The theme of today's service, originally titled UU Pop Quiz, does not mean there'll be a test after the sermon, so you can relax. A better descriptor would be, who knew they were UU? We will explore the lives of several people who lived out their UU principles in the arts. Our goal today is to lift up the artists in word and music that are visible representatives of Unitarian Universalism. You may not think you can name any mycologists, but you can. Had she been born in a more enlightened age, Beatrix Potter would be known for her work on mushrooms. Potter is now the subject of Drawn to Nature, an exhibit at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. The show covers Potter's life as a scientist and conservationist and explores the places and animals that inspired her most beloved characters. The exhibit includes over 200 sketches, paintings, letters, manuscripts, diaries, and family photographs covering her childhood and her later life as a savvy businesswoman and an accomplished student of nature. You can also see the letters that Potter sent in the 1890s to the, to the son of her former governess. Those letters included illustrations of a rabbit named Peter. Eventually, Potter thought Peter might make a fun character for a children's book, but she couldn't get a publisher interested. Undeterred, she self-published her book, and Peter Rabbit quickly hopped into literary history. Potter's books have since sold more than 250 million copies. But her influence on the modern world is even larger than that. When Potter sewed a Peter Rabbit doll and patented it, she became a pioneer of character merchandising, which is now a massive market that includes story-related toys, figures, and costumes for, from Warner Brothers, Disney, and more. Going back further, you might think that Beatrix Potter was a lonely child. Perhaps you'd be right. True, she lived in a large city, London, England. True, the only child she had to play with was her brother, Bertram, and he was usually away at boarding school. Beatrix had no school friends because she didn't go to school. Instead, a governess taught her at home. There were no other children her parents would let her play with in their London neighborhood. But Beatrix was not as lonely as you might think. She had the friendship she felt from all the animals and plants she met on her rambles through the countryside. Beatrix's family took long vacations in Scotland and the Lake District of England. She brought the countryside back to London by taming wild rabbits as pets. She kept country mice in cages and also lizards, snakes, and even a pet bat. In the countryside, Beatrix loved to spend hours out of doors. She drew detailed pictures of plants and animals she found. She wanted to know everything about the natural world. She planned to be a scientist when she grew up but Beatrix was young more than 100 years ago. It was not considered proper for a middle-class girl to have a job, particularly as a scientist. Beatrix's parents were very concerned that she grow up to be a proper young lady. No one encouraged her to draw animals and plants, but Beatrix kept studying her friends in the natural world on her own. The drawings and paintings she made were greatly respected by scientists who wanted to learn more about the animal and plants and appreciated a close up and careful look at nature. Beatrix was especially interested in mushrooms and mosses. By observing these plants, she discovered that the lichen that grows on rocks and trees is actually a combination of moss and a fungus. Her scientific sketches of nature even though they helped make discoveries, were not the same as having a real job as a scientist. But when Beatrix was grown up, her loving attention to the natural world earned her a different success than she ever imagined. In 1893, Beatrix sat down to write a letter to a five-year-old Noel who had been sick in bed for a long time. 
She started her letter, I don't know what to write you, so I shall tell you a story about four little rabbits whose names are Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. Have you ever heard of these little rabbits? <laughs> well, Beatrix Potter made them up based on rabbits she had watched closely and on her imagination. She drew Noel, Noel a picture of the four young rabbits and their mother. So began the tale of Peter the Rabbit, which you may know and children have been enjoying for more than a hundred years. Beatrix wrote and illustrated 22 more books, all about the animals that she had been friends with in the English countryside. Hedgehogs, frogs, ducks, house mice, and field mice, and squirrels. She knew them very well from spending time among them and observing their ways. Beatrix earned enough money from her books to buy a farm in the English Lake District, a place she always loved. She raised sheep on her farm. Over time, she bought more country land to keep it as natural home for animals and plants and not to be used for factories and houses. When Beatrix Potter died in 1943, she gave 4,000 acres to the National Trust, an English organization that protects and preserves beautiful natural lands. If you travel to England today, you can visit Potter's farmhouse. You can walk in the countryside, just as she did so many years ago when she was a young child. Yet you only need to open one of her books to meet the animals and plants that she loved. By observing, loving, and drawing her friends, she preserved her connection with the world of nature for children like all of you and all of us to share. Kurt Vonnegut has been described as a writer who used an ironic, humorous, yet dark writing style that challenged us to explore universal questions. Who are we? How, do we, how does what we do affect others? Where is our humanity? His serious moral commentaries are the thread that runs through all of his writing. Writing was his heartbeat. Vonnegut wrote for the student newspaper at the Indianapolis High School where he grew up. At his family's urging, his family's urging um, to do something practical when he was at Cornell College, he took chemistry. But the student newspaper, the Daily Sun, is where he spent most of his time. Because of the controversial nature of his articles, he lost his scholarship. Combined with his poor grades, Vonnegut dropped out of college. So what did that lead to? He lost his deferment status in 1943 and was called up to the army. While fighting in the Battle of the Bulge, he was captured and sent to Dresden, Germany. Vonnegut and his fellow prisoners were held three stories underground in Schlachthaus 5, Slaughterhouse 5. Ironically, because of being housed underground, they survived the bombing. But tragically, he and his fellow prisoners were put to work digging up dead the dead buried under the rubble. This experience fueled much of his writing, notably in his third novel, Slaughterhouse Five. When Vonnegut was mustered out coming home with a purple heart, he did what most young soldiers did at that time, married and got a job. He wrote advertising copy for General Electric, but continued to write his own short stories on the side. When his first short story was published, in 1950, he quit GE and moved his family, which now included three children, to Barnstable, Massachusetts. Vonnegut was a prolific writer. Over his lifetime, five plays, three short stories, 14 novels, 
and numerous articles for magazines were published. In high school, I read my first Kurt Vonnegut book, Welcome to the Monkey House. It's a collection of short stories about the ways society could be different in the future, but taking it to an absurd level. His concepts may be familiar now, but when it was written, its themes were radical. In the story, Harrison Bergeron, the government has become obsessed with ensuing that everyone is equal. No one is supposed to be smarter, more skilled, more attractive, more anything than anybody else. This is overseen by the government's handicapper general. If you are more intelligent than average, you must wear a handicap radio in your ear that can sense when you are thinking deeply. It feeds random, disturbing noises that disrupt your thoughts. Singers must garble their voices to mask their vocal skills. Ballerinas wear weights to, um, and buckshot to equalize their performances. Now, obviously, um, as a teen, I thought this was pretty fascinating. To me, it showed that when we create artificial barriers in the name of doing something equal for people, we really aren't doing anything for anybody. And what it should really be about is people connecting and dismantling barriers so that we see each person for who they are and provide the opportunities for true equality. What gave him the desire to hold up for inspection the ills of society and government? As mentioned before, his experience in World War II was part of it. And what else? The Vonneguts were members of All Souls Unitarian Church in Indianapolis, and Kurt Sr., his father, was an architect and had designed the congregation's first building. Unitarian minister Francis Scott Corey Wicks married the Vonnegut parents and the family attended church there. Vonnegut wrote later that he learned from them that racial prejudices were stupid and cruel. Vonnegut thought too often religion was a cover for hypocrisy. His view of religion was pragmatic. What mattered was its usefulness in creating community and making people kind and helpful. He said, I am an atheist, or at best a Unitarian, who winds up in church quite a lot. And he also said, I am a humanist, which means in part that I have tried to behave decently without expectations of rewards or punishments after I am dead. Like each of us, Kurt Vonnegut was undeniably human and fallible, yet kind and charitable. He had two marriages, six children, three with his first wife, Jane, then adopted his three nephews when his sister and her husband were killed. Throughout the 80s and 90s, Vonnegut acted as a powerful, powerful spokesman for the preservation of our constitutional freedoms, for nuclear arms control, and for the protection of the Earth's fragile biosphere. As the new century began, Vonnegut continued to try to be, as he said, a responsible elder in our society, decrying the militarization of our country after the terrorist attacks of 2001. And Vonnegut died in 2007 at the age of 84. I end with this last quote from Kurt Vonnegut. If you were to bother to read my books, to behave as educated persons would, you would learn that they are not sexy and do not fa argue in favor of wildness of any kind. They beg that people be kinder and more responsible than they often are.
Edward Essling Cummings, better known to us as E.E. E. Cummings, was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1894 to Unitarian minister, the Reverend Edward Cummings and Rebecca Clark Cummings. It was a loving literary home near Harvard University, his father's alma mater, and later his own. From infancy, he was encouraged to rever revere words. Parents who save their children's scribblings will be gratified to know that Cummings' mother did too, and his first poem, dictated at age three, remains in Harvard's archive. The Reverend Cummings, the Unitarian pastor to Boston South Congregational Church, might be surprised to hear his son lauded as a Unitarian poet given their father's son's struggles. Cummings' devotion to his parents was deep, but the desire to break free of their influence is clear in a letter he wrote to his sister Elizabeth. Never take anyone's word for anything. Find out for yourself. I was going to say it louder. It's, all in, it's in all caps, but I didn't want to overdo it on a Sunday morning. The poet who became famous for his lowercase I would ferociously proclaim the primacy of individual experience, which places him in the tradition of American romantics such as Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. But Cummings innovations, he called them his firstness, were unlike any writers before. His poem, One, illustrates some of the techniques coming used to make language new. The word gravestone is stretched so that words within the word appear while the letters mimic the twisting descent of a snowflake. His style has been called literary cubism and he embraced the modernistic movement of the 1920s both as a poet and as a painter. Though steeped in literary traditions imbibed at home and in school, Cummings was hostile towards convention, a feeling he poured into the poem, The Cambridge Ladies Who Lived in Furnished Souls. Science raised his hackles too. While you and I have lips and voices, which are for kissing and to sing with, who cares if some one-eyed son of a bee invents an instrument to measure spring with? Cummings spent his adult life in New York City, summering at his New Hampshire farm. His romantic life was tumultuous compared to his staid upbringing. He married three times. Two of the marriages were legal and brief. The other was common and spanned 30 years. And he had a strained relationship with his daughter, Nancy. His friends included John Dos Pesos, Pesos Hart Crane, and Ezra Pound. In 1952, he gave the Charles Eliot Norton Lectures at Harvard, which he called non-lectures, since he claimed he didn't know anything, a sentiment rarely expressed from a Harvard podium. Cummings was a stylistic acrobat who commanded both traditional form and free verse. His love poems are among the century's best. The besotted need look no further than you being in love for swooning material. Literary critics often have found his artistic vision simplistic in poems like Let's Live Suddenly Without Thinking, sounding like teen manifestos. But for many readers, their exuberance made them thrilling. The large body of his poetry, nonfiction, and drama is a treasure trove with all original typographical quirks restored. Though his life's proje project was rebellion, the roots of his poetry are evident in his father's sermons. The kingdom of heaven is no spiritual roof garden. It's inside of you. That idea echoes in the closing couplet of, I thank you, God, for most this amazing, which is, for all its unconventionality, a sonnet. Now the ears of my ears are awake. Now the eyes of my eyes are opened. I will close with this quote from E.E. E. Cummings, 20th century American poet and Unitarian who died in 1962. The world is mudlicious and puddle wonderful.
Zach Walls wrote his first book in 2012, My Two Moms, when he was 21 years old. His writing is full of hope, humor, and a certain earnestness. He is a quintessential Midwesterner from the state of Iowa. He was involved in scouting, achieved the rank of Eagle Scout. In high school, he was on the swim team, the football team, the debate club, was on the staff of the school newspaper, he attended church regularly, and was active in their youth group activities. The, bleh, I'm sorry, that, the denomination that was and is still a large part of his identity is Unitarian Universalism. Now each chapter in his book explores his experiences growing up with two moms using the frameworks of Boy Scout law. Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. But in the writing, you see the real filter of UU faith. In the chapter titled Kind, he writes this. If you look at the word kindness, its root is kind, like humankind. Kind is a noun referring to a group of people or things that shares similar characteristics, our humanity. To be kind as a verb is to recognize our shared characteristics, our shared humanity, and to remember to respect one another because beneath the veneer of our aesthetic differences is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Terry Walls knew that when she became a mother, she would face pushback from her family and society for being a lesbian parent. Despite that, she had two children, Zach and later a daughter, Zebby. When she met, fell in love with Jackie Rieger, their family was complete. Both of the moms worked in the medical field. Terry is an internist and Jackie is a nurse. They lived and live in Iowa City, a university town not unlike Ann Arbor. Zach's scouting experience was positive. Both moms were involved with a troop. Their community was welcoming and accepting. But Zach often felt he had to hide a part of himself. When asked at school, what do your mom and dad do? He often responded with, oh, they both work in healthcare. That changed when he was a high school freshman. In a journalism class, learning about how to write an opinion piece, he tackled the issue of derisive words like fag and phrases like that's so gay in his peer group. It then ran in the school paper. Amazingly enough, it was well received and he continued to write in that manner. So this led to more opportunities to write and to speak publicly about the harm being done to those in the gay community. In 2011, Zach spoke to the Iowa House Judiciary Committee in a public hearing on a proposed Iowa constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage. Mind you, same-sex marriage had been legal in Iowa since 2009 with the landmark state Supreme Court decision in Varnum v. Breen that invalidated the state's ban on same-sex marriage. Zach's speech went viral. You can still find it on YouTube. It's fascinating to watch. As a result, when the proposed amendment was finally voted on, it failed. Now I know I, today I described it as a look at UU Arts and admittedly as a one book wonder, this is a bit of a stretch, but he's still young. But I also wanted to show how he He's lived out our UU principles, which we covenant to affirm and promote, speaks volumes. Since the publication of his book, Zach Walls has been a vocal activist about many issues. At the Boy Scouts National Annual Meeting in 2012, wearing his Boy Scout uniform, he delivered petitions with 275,000 signatures in support of equality in scouts. That same year, he spoke at the Democratic National Convention. He earned his BA from the University of Iowa 
and a master's in public affairs from Princeton University. In 2017, he ran and won a seat in the Iowa Senate and was named the minority leader by his fellow Democrats. Currently, he is running for re-election. Before the final hymn, our guest musician today, Mira Walker, will talk about the connection between the mission, musicians and Unitarian Universalism. Good morning. I just want to provide a little context for the music that you've heard this morning and how it fits in with our theme. The first piece, the prelude that I played, is titled Peace of the Woods, and it was by Edvard Grieg, who was a Norwegian composer. Um, he was a Unitarian. In 1899, Grieg canceled his concerts in France in protest of the Dreyfus Affair, which was an anti-Semitic scandal that was then roiling French politics. Grieg hoped that the French might, quote, soon return to the spirit of 1789 when the French Republic declared that it would defend basic human rights. Many of Grieg's pieces reflect the beauty of humankind um, through fairy tales and also the beauty of our natural world um, through depictions of different things in nature. Carolyn McDade's hymn, Spirit of Life, is beloved in UU congregations. It is written that she, quote, is a lover of language and sound to the power of the human voice singing and speaking truth to move society to just and liberating transformation. Through song and singing, she helps us deepen human consciousness and understand ourselves as part of a living planet. While she does not identify with any one denomination, we tend to think of her as a UU. Sarah Dan Jones says this, quote, my mission is to spread the Unitarian Universalist faith through music, which I do so by empowering congregational singing, shared ministry, and active participation in the UUA. She came to create Meditation on Breathing, which we used as our reflective hymn this morning. She wrote this in response to 9-11. Pete Seeger, who we will sing shortly, and who I also played a little of his tune earlier during the offering, is a legendary musician and icon who sang about injustice and hope for nearly 100 years. He was born in 1914 and died in 2014. He did not belong to any organized church until he became a member of the UU Community Church in the mid-90s and certainly lived out our principles and ideals through his activism, which he primarily did through music. Finally, the piece that I just played is by Amy Beach, who was born in 1867 and was an American musical prodigy. She did not identify as UU, however, she performed at the age of seven in a Unitarian church for a benefit, and I believe that she lived out the ideals of Unitarian Universalism in her life. Much like Beatrix Potter, she faced a lot of difficulties in pursuing her dreams as a woman pianist um, in her time and was often held back by a restrictive marriage. However, she still continued to advocate for women's education, especially in the musical sphere up until her death. Thank you. Please rise and body our spirit for our final hymn, To Everything There Is a Season.
Go now into this world as a symbol, as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen. Blessed be. <laughs>